Democrats Divided, a recap and analysis of the second presidential debate, including what former Vice President Joe Biden said about abortion. Budget battle, lawmakers vote on the spending proposal reached by President Trump and Democrats. Burned to the ground, an update on the historic church in Texas destroyed earlier this week in a fire. And a real masterpiece. We'll show you a Catholic church in Rome with three paintings by Caravaggio. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, August 1st, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Jason Calvi. The Democratic frontrunner for president defends his support of abortion. Former Vice President Joe Biden and other Democrats debated issues like immigration, climate change, and health care. The moderators never asked about abortion. Still, Biden shared his views. White House correspondent Mark Irons tells us more. Jason, the entire Democratic field supports abortion. The presidential candidates have already made that clear. The Catholic Church says life is sacred and no one has the right to destroy an innocent human being. But last night, Biden was challenged about his evolution on this topic from a fellow Democrat. Talk about now running for president and you change your position on the Hyde Amendment. Senator Kamala Harris questions the former vice president about his flip-flop on the Hyde Amendment. It stops federal taxpayer dollars from paying for most abortions. Catholic Joe Biden supported that until just last month. I support a woman's right to choose. I support it's a constitutional right. I've supported it. I will continue to support it. And I will, in fact, move as president to see to that the Congress legislates that that is the law. Biden now calls for the repeal of the Hyde Amendment. He and Senator Harris also sparred throughout the night over health care proposals. The senators had several plans so far. You can't beat President Trump with double talk on this plan. Unfortunately, Vice President Biden, you're just simply inaccurate. For a Democrat to be running for president with a plan that does not cover everyone, I think is without excuse. On immigration, the former vice president was challenged about high deportation numbers under the Obama administration. So did you say those deportations were a good idea? Or did you go to the president and say, this is a mistake, we shouldn't do it? Which one? I was vice president. I am not the president. And when Biden launched his own attack on Senator Cory Booker's criminal justice record. You're dipping into the Kool-Aid and you don't even know the flavor. A diverse mix of candidates argued what separates them from President Trump. The opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. The problem is that this current president is continuing to betray us. And Democrats also debated their plans to address climate change. But I will lead a worldwide conversation about the urgency of this crisis. On that topic, Pope Francis has cited droughts, heat waves, fires and floods around the world, calling them a dire premonition of much worse things to come unless we act and act urgently. Governor Jay Inslee of Washington says defeating climate change is his top priority. Too little, too late is too dangerous. And we have to have a bold plan, and mine has been called the gold standard. The Trump campaign was quick to criticize Democrats, saying they had no original thoughts and plenty of socialist stupidity. They call the debates another win for President Trump. At the White House, Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. Let's talk about this week's Democratic debates with Michael New, associate scholar at the pro-life Charlotte Lozier Institute. Michael, glad to have you on. Oh, thanks for having me. So last night, there were no questions the last two nights on abortion, but we did see Kamala Harris bring up the issue of the Hyde Amendment with Joe Biden. What did you make of that interaction? I thought it was interesting. I think that quite honestly, Biden's answer was very disingenuous. Uh, he did admit to changing positions on the Hyde Amendment. Uh, he supported it. Uh, now he opposes it. And he claimed that his reason for the position switch was that there used to be alternative sources of funding for elective abortions. And that's just not the case. I mean, the Hyde Amendment places a limit on federal taxpayer dollars and how they can be used to fund elective abortions. Uh, there are about 15 states. They use their own taxpayer dollars to fund elective abortions. But if you live in the 35 other states uh, which don't fund elective abortions through Medicaid, uh, abortions aren't subsidized with taxpayer dollars. There was never any alternative source of funding. So Biden is either just misinformed or just trying to mislead people on this. 
and, and Joseph Biden last night said that he supports a woman's right to choose, as we, as we just heard in Mark's story there, and he, he said, uh, you know, that uh, abortion should be enshrined in federal law. How is this going to play out in the 2020 elections? I think it's going to really hurt him politically. This may make some sense for him uh, during the presidential primaries because many Democratic voters do support legal abortion. But when you look at the general public, uh, voters are a lot more concerned or a lot more um, mixed on this issue. I think that uh, if you look at uh, polling, uh, pro-life laws, incremental pro-life laws enjoy law support. Waiting periods, bans on late-term abortions, uh, these are all things that pull very well. So I think his plan to kind of put abortion rights into federal law will backfire in the general election. And so President Trump says, predicts that Joseph Bi Joe Biden is going to receive the nomination for the Democrats. How would this issue then play out if it's Trump versus Biden? I think it'll play out well for pro-lifers. Again, I think pro-lifers are happy with a lot of things that uh, Donald Trump is doing. He's cut funding for Planned Parenthood. He's strengthened the Mexico City policy. His judicial nominations have been good. And on a lot of incremental pro-life laws, enjoy, again, broad support, waiting periods, parental involvement laws. These are all things that Biden is now on the record as opposing. So I think very clearly this could play out well for Republicans and pro-lifers in 2020. What did you make of two nights with the moderators not touching the issue of abortion? This was brought up on the sidelines between candidates, but not by the moderators. Although it's disappointing, but honestly, I thought it was frankly unsurprising. I mean, debates are useful and they can highlight disagreement. And the moderators focus on some issues where there is disagreement among Democrats. They do disagree on aspects of health care, on immigration, on criminal justice reform. There's basically agreement on abortion amongst those 20 candidates. They all support Roe v. Wade. They all oppose the Hyde Amendment. So there's really not much to frankly debate. So let's talk about that health care, though. They did debate health care last night, and Joe Biden, Vice President Biden, did introduce last month his health care plan. What's in there, and what does it say about the life issue? Well, it's pretty interesting that most people are focusing on the fact that Biden does not support Medicare for all, but he has some interesting things about health care. He does support funding Planned Parenthood, not surprising. He supports Roe v. Wade. But what's interesting about his plan is that he wants the Department of Justice to uh, oppose incremental pro-life laws, including clinic regulations, including waiting periods, including parental involvement laws. Again, it's not really clear what a Biden the Justice Department could do because the Supreme Court's actually upheld these laws in the past, but it does show he's against them. And I think that gives President Trump Republicans uh, some real ammunition to use against him should he be the nominee in 2020. Okay, many more months to go before that, though. Michael New, Associate Scholar at the Charlotte Osier Institute, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, thanks for having me. And the leader of the Archdiocese of Washington says President Trump's comments on Baltimore and the responses to it deepened division. Archbishop Wilton Gregory writes in the Catholic Standard, as an American, a Christian, a Catholic pastor, I pray that our president, other national leaders, and all Americans will do all we can to respect the dignity of God's children and nothing to further divide our nation. A bipartisan budget and debt deal has passed the Senate and is heading to the White House for President Donald Trump's signature. Democratic Senator Chris Coons criticized the more than $1.3 trillion deal for adding to the deficit. We are delaying a day of reckoning in this country that is inevitably uh, coming our way. We are going to have to pay for all of this. We are just in fundamentally different places about how to do so, um, how to raise revenue or how to reduce expenditures. Um, and we don't even really have a process in place at this point to move us towards that resolution. I hope to support efforts of a number of my colleagues to do that. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi won House Democratic unity on this bill. It lifts the country's debt limit for two years that allows the country to borrow more money to pay its bills. The last rebel fighters in Mozambique laid down their arms. The country's president and the leader of the opposition forces signed a peace deal. It ends years of fighting following a 15-year civil war. Next month, Pope Francis visits the southern African country. It's roughly one quarter Catholic. And Pope Francis sends a video message to missionaries meeting in Indonesia. The Holy Father says God uses missionaries the way bakers use yeast. They're leaven in society. The Pope also says Christians are people who go forward, never backward. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has a message for North Korea. We stand ready to continue our diplomatic conversation with the North Koreans. I, I regret that uh, it looks like I'm not going to have an opportunity to do that while I'm here in Bangkok, um, but we're, we're ready to go. Secretary Pompeo also says he's working with his Chinese counterpart to end the U.S.-China trade war. It intensified today with news the president would place more tariffs on Chinese imports. And the United States slaps new sanctions on Iran, this time against the country's foreign minister. 
The Trump administration places financial penalties on Javid Zarif. It's part of a plan to pressure the Islamic Republic. The country's president responds. Hassan Rouhani calls the move childish and gets in the way of diplomacy. A suicide bombing in Yemen kills at least 51 people. Rebels fired a missile at a military parade and targeted a police station. The attacks also hurt dozens. Coming up, analysis of New Jersey's assisted suicide law in effect today. And an update on the historic Catholic church in Texas that burned to the ground. New Jersey's assisted suicide law goes into effect today. All of the state's Catholic bishops oppose it and fought it for more than seven years. The law allows suicide drugs for New Jersey patients deemed to have less than six months to live. To talk about this, we're joined by Wesley Smith, author of several books on assisted suicide. Thanks for coming back. Now, when New Jersey's Democratic Governor Phil Murphy signed the bill in April, he said as a Catholic he grappled with his position on the issue, but he went on to say that as a public official, he could not deny this alternative to others. Why is assisted suicide not a solution in your view? Well, it's, it's abandonment of patients, and, and uh, it, it strikes me when uh, politicians say things like that. I don't think he would say it about the death penalty, uh, but I think that when you think about assisted suicide in Mother Teresa and the kind of care she provided people and the kind of love she provided people, I doubt she'd be very proud of the governor tonight. I want to read to you from the Bishop of Metuchen in New Jersey, and he said that this law in, in particular is a threat to the elderly. Here's what he said. He says, it could make people who feel undue pressure to view this as an option to prevent being a burden to others. Um, what do you make of that? Well, if you take a look at the statistics from places where assisted suicide is legal, the reason people do it isn't because they're in pain that cannot be alleviated. That's the fear mongering to sell it. The reason people actually commit suicide is they're worried about being a burden. They're worried about losing the ability to engage in enjoyable activities. They're worried, for example, that their loved ones won't have good memories of them if they watch them go through decline. And I'm afraid that some people are putting themselves out of their family's misery. Uh, th this is an abandoning kind of an agenda that pretends to be about compassion, but compassion means to suffer with, and assisted suicide is discarding the problem. So what can our viewers do then to turn things around, to send well, a positive message to these people that are sick? Uh, if Maine finishes legalization, which it looks like it will, that will only be nine states in this country that have legalized assisted suicide. Any place where assisted suicide is illegal, your viewers need to engage if there's an attempt to legalize it and really put pressure on the legislature not to do so. If people sit back on their sofas and think it can never happen here, that's precisely how it could happen there. So, so much more to look at on this issue, but Wesley Smith, I know you've been monitoring this for, for 25 years. Thank you so much for being on the show tonight. We appreciate it very, very well, much. Well, thank, thank you for you. having me. And a priest from the Diocese of Austin says an electrical issue likely caused the fire that burned down a historic church. Monsignor Elmore Holtman grew up going to Our Lady of the Visitation in Westphalia, Texas, as did his parents. He says the building was loved. Everything took place in that little community. Even our, uh, we had a big dance hall which belonged to the uh, parish. We had our dances there, we had our parties, we had things that went on. And all of it was focal point. The church was the focal point. So that particular building is, is really, uh, you know, known. The church was 124 years old. It's believed to be a total loss, though rescuers did save some of the Blessed Sacrament. Up next, analysis of a public debate over a theological institute. And we hear about a church in Rome with several impressive paintings. The head of a Vatican school on the family says it has not changed its focus. Some current and former students say the John Paul II Theological Institute is moving away from its core mission. They accuse the school of no longer being faithful to the vision of St. John Paul II. But the school says critics are pursuing their own interests and not those of the saint nor Pope Francis. Joining us now to talk about this is J.D. Flynn, editor-in-chief of Catholic News Agency. First of all, tell us about the Pontifical John Paul II Institute. Why was it founded and what does it do? Well, Jason, the John Paul II Institute was founded um, in 1981 with the idea of studying 
the theology and philosophy of the family that was being developed by John Paul II. So based upon his book, Love and Responsibility, and then the work that became the theology of the body. And it really became over time a graduate school that was sort of at the center of um, of the theological vision that John Paul II has had for marriage, for sexuality, and for the family. So now more than 250 current and former students went public with their concerns about the school. What did they say? Well, two years ago, Pope Francis called for a broadening of the school's um, curriculum, its scope, and its mission so that it would continue to study theology and philosophy, but also incorporate um, sociology and, um, and other social scientific ways of looking at the family. And the process of revising the curriculum has been sort of underway for the past two years. And now that it's come to a conclusion, some students say that the curriculum has been changed in a way that takes away um, the emphasis on moral theology, and they've protested especially the dismissal of two longstanding teachers at the school. Is this just a clash between those who identify with John Paul II and those who identify with Pope Francis? No, I, I don't think it is because both the teachers and the, fa the, the faculty and the students who we've spoken with really support and understand Pope Francis's desire to broaden the vision of the school. Um, I think their frustration has been with those who have been charged with implementing that vision, a sense that they have that um, there hasn't been due regard paid for um, not only the school's history and its longstanding mission, but also for the academic freedom of the faculty members. Some some faculty members have said to us they feel like um, the, the, the theological emphasis of the school is really being pushed out and the theological approach of the school is being pushed out in favor of new approaches. And so it's not really about Pope Francis. It's just about um, those who have been entrusted with modifying the school's curriculum and the way that that has gone. So how do you think these issues are going to be dealt with? Well, they're still very much at a head. Students and faculty members are going public with their frustrations about um, the dismissal of teachers, the adaptation of the curriculum, um, governance and structure issues. And, um, and although the students and faculty members say that they're very willing to work with administrators to um, implement Pope Francis's vision in a constructive way, they don't yet feel that the administrators have, have listened to them. They, they say that it would be easier to work together if the dismissed faculty members were brought back to the school, if there was a more open conversation and more mutual understanding. But from their perspective, there has not yet been openness to that from the point of the administration. Okay, well, thanks for summarizing this very complex issue. J.D. Flynn, Editor-in-Chief of Catholic News Agency. Thanks so much, Jason. And finally tonight, we take you to the Church of San Luigi, or St. Louis, home of Rome's French community. It's located in the historic city center. The parish is a magnificent example of Baroque architecture. Today it serves French Catholics as well as tourists and pilgrims. It also houses masterpieces by the great Italian painter Caravaggio. Those paintings feature St. Matthew. Father Will Conker joins us from Rome. He's the chaplain of this famous church. You welcome the French religious community and pilgrims. What is your mission? Our mission is, as you just said, to welcome the pilgrims, welcome the tourists. Many people come into our church simply because they've heard of three very, very famous paintings that are there and they don't really know much more. And so we have a whole program of visits and trying to welcome people and turn those who just come as tourists into pilgrims of faith so that they may you know, walk on an itinerary of faith and come closer to Christ. And your church is a popular stop for tourists because of the paintings of Caravaggio inside. Uh, can you tell us about those works and how they touch the visitors? Well, there's three paintings uh, representing the call, inspiration, and martyrdom of St. Matthew. It's three beautiful paintings painted by Caravaggio, who's one of the greatest painters of the Italian Renaissance. The three paintings are extremely intense and they're, in a way, something that get back to you as a mirror. You look at what's happening and you cannot but ask yourself the question, is Christ asking me that question? Is Christ asking me, will you follow me? All of us in the end, we're all tax collectors, we're all people like Matthew, we're all bent over ourselves, we're all taken by our jealousy and our sin. And Christ comes and shows us mercy. And as you know, Pope Francis went to that church and that's where he picked up his motto of his pontificate, Miserando Aquil Eligendo, chosen by God's mercy. And that's what we hope all our visitors can hear as they come into our church. You are chosen by God's mercy. Open up to his love and he will change your life. And, and you're being called yourself to a big change. We understand you're moving to Cambodia in October to do mission work. 
What will you be doing there? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. It's a great mission. I mean, there's a big mission to be done in Cambodia. I am part of a society called the Paris Foreign Mission Society, set up 360 years ago, just in back of us, right here in St. Peter's by the Pope, who saw a great need after the persecutions of Christians in Japan to set up a new missionary society and to send missionary bishops to set up a local clergy, a local clergy in Asia to serve their people. And so I'm part of that society. In Cambodia, we've been there for many years. The recent years have been terrible, absolutely terrible. I'm sure your viewers know about the terrible communist regime that devastated that country. The Khmer Rouge with Pol Pot genociding their own people and killing, obviously, so many Christians, almost all Christians, all priests were killed. And when our first missionaries were allowed back into the country, almost secretly in the 90s, well, they had to start everything from scratch. Now the church has never grown so fast in Cambodia. Some missionaries have done an amazing, amazing work, like translating the Bible into the local Khmer language, uh, setting up new churches. The church is a church of catechumens, so all of them are, you know, RCIA Christians. And it's just incredible to see what's happening in Cambodia and there's still so much to be done and so many people who want to know more about Christ and his church and who is this God of love. And Father Will Conquer, you're going to be going right into the heart of that mission and spreading that message of mercy and love to the people of Cambodia. Thank you so much for your time. You're the chaplain of the Church of St. Louis of the French. Thank you for joining us today. I'll just say one last thing if I may. That call that I have is not just for me, it's for any of your viewers and we need a new generation of missionaries. I'm not the only one, and people who are viewing this need to hear that call in their life. They need to answer that call. So many of us don't watch EWTN. So many of us are waiting for new disciples of Christ to meet them, to encounter them, and to come to them to say that the love of God has come to them today. Like Christ came to Matthew, we need missionaries to bring out that good news to the people of the world today. What a beautiful story and beautiful testimony. We will pray for more missionaries. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Jason Calvi, and we thank you for watching tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night, and God bless.